One acre of trees can outfeed a cornfield, and no one's talking about it. Species like honey locust, mesquite, and chestnut aren't just shade or firewood. Their pods can test at 12 to 18% protein and up to 35% sugars, levels on par with cracked corn. A single mature honey locust can drop 1,500 to 2,000 pounds of pods a season, enough to finish out cattle, goats, or hogs without buying grain. Here's the kicker. Before corn and soy subsidies reshaped agriculture, farmers across the world relied on these trees. USDA trials in the 1930s even projected honey locust as a full grain replacement on small farms. And in parts of Europe, finishing pigs on mast crops like chestnuts is still a premium system today. In this video, we're not doing a surface tour. We'll break down the real yield numbers, the feed performance across species, the regenerative soil benefits, and the economics of integrating feed trees into modern livestock systems. If you think trees are just background in your pasture, this may change how you design your entire acre, but don't get carried away yet. Because the same trees that can slash your feed bills can also wreck your pasture if you don't know the pitfalls. I'll show you both sides and the mistakes farmers regret most at the end. Most people assume feeding trees to livestock is some new permaculture trend, but farmers have been doing it for centuries. Early American settlers leaned on honey locust and mesquite pods to push livestock through lean winters. Indigenous communities did the same, not just as emergency feed, but as a dependable system baked into their seasonal cycles. Cross the ocean and it's even clearer. In Europe, entire farming economies were built around tree mast. Chestnuts and acorns weren't just snacks for hogs, they were the core of regional meat systems. The famous Iberian hams of Spain? Still finished on acorns today because the flavor and fat quality are unmatched. During World War II, when grain shipments to Britain collapsed, farmers finished pigs almost entirely on acorns and chestnuts. No imported grain, no soy, just trees carrying the food system through the war. So what happened? Cheap corn and subsidized soy flooded the market, and tree feeds disappeared from the rotation. Not because they didn't work, but because they couldn't compete with industrial grain prices. So if the economics, not the biology, made tree feed disappear, the obvious question is, how much do these trees actually produce? Most farmers think trees can't compete with row crops for sheer tonnage, but the numbers say otherwise. A single mature honey locust can drop 50 to 100 pounds of pods every fall. Plant them at density in a silvopasture system, and you're looking at 4,000 to 6,000 pounds per acre. And that's before factoring in what the pasture underneath still produces. Wild mesquite in Texas tells the same story. Stands routinely yield 1,500 to 3,000 pounds of pods per acre, and under management trials, some plots topped 4,000 pounds, feed comparable to low-end corn yields. To put that in perspective, one mature honey locust can drop more calories than an acre of oats, and it does it every single year without replanting. Imagine a cow eating grain-equivalent feed that literally fell from the sky. Corn requires annual tillage, hybrid seed, synthetic fertilizer, and diesel. These trees? They drop their harvest year after year without a dime of replanting or input. And this is not new like we said earlier. USDA bulletins from the 1930s recorded honey locust trials where pod yields were projected to fully replace grain rations for small farms. At the time, the numbers penciled out, but cheap corn made the research disappear into the archives. Across mast-producing species, from locust to mesquite to chestnut, you're talking anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 pounds of feed per acre, falling for free every autumn. It's an ignored yield layer that most modern farmers simply don't count. Next, let's get into their actual nutrition. When most people picture tree fodder, they assume it's rough, fibrous, and low value. But the feed profiles of these trees are far from. Honey locust pods routinely test at 12 to 18% protein and up to 35% sugars. Like we said, basically like cracked corn. And unlike corn, the fiber in the pods is highly digestible, making them safe for cattle, goats, and sheep alike. Mesquite pods go even further. In Texas trials, mature stands produced pods with up to 30% sugar content. For centuries, indigenous communities and early settlers milled those pods into flour, a ration both people and livestock could thrive on. Today, mesquite flour is still sold as a high-value human food, but for animals, it's an underutilized energy bomb. And the performance data isn't just historical anecdotes. Argentine trials found that goats finished 20% faster when honey locust pods were added to their ration. Farmers there noticed higher body condition scores, faster market weight, and healthier animals on less purchased feed. 
Farmers in Spain still finish premium pork entirely on chestnuts, meat that sells for double the price of conventional pork because of its flavor. That's tree fodder literally turning into premium income. The big picture? These pods aren't survival rations. They're high-energy, nutrient-dense feeds that rival, and sometimes outperform, the grains farmers currently import by the ton. The difference is these fall from the sky, year after year, with no diesel, no seed, no fertilizer bill. But how do they fit in a regenerative system? We want to pause real quick to share something with you we think is so important to the future of farms. There's a new app called Red Hen. It's where you can find local farms and buy direct in just a few clicks. With 114,000 farms lost in the last five years, it's essential that we support farms with our buying dollars. If you are in the US, check out the app and support your local farms. Now back to it. Here's where these feed trees start to look less like an alternative and more like a keystone strategy. Because they don't just provide calories, they actually rewire the ecology of your farm. Mesquite, for example, isn't just dropping pods. As a legume, mesquite fixes roughly 50 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. At today's prices, that's 100 to 150 dollars of fertilizer from a tree that also drops feed. Shade from these trees cuts evaporation by 20 to 40 percent in hot climates, keeping cool season grasses alive weeks longer into summer. Their roots drive four to six feet deep, fracturing compaction layers that annuals can't touch. And every fall, leaf litter adds a slow-release mulch, feeding soil microbes and locking carbon below ground. The longevity piece is what really changes the math. You plant once, and the system pays you back for decades. Compare that to annual grains, seed every spring, spray every summer, harvest every fall, then start all over again. A honey locust you plant today could still be feeding livestock and enriching soil in 2075, and the functions stack. The same tree gives you fodder pods, firewood, shade, and fertility. You can graze under it, bale hay around it, or run pigs through it. The more layers you stack, the more resilient the system becomes. Researchers in the UK found that silvopasture systems using honey locust increased pasture carrying capacity by 40% compared to open grassland. In other words, the same acre held 40% more animal days simply because of the trees. That's not theory, that's boots on the ground economics meeting ecology. And perhaps the most overlooked advantage, animals harvesting their own feed. Every pod a cow eats straight off the ground is a pound of hay you didn't have to cut, bale, haul, or buy. That's less diesel, less labor, and more profit margin. Before you even factor in the soil fertility you're banking year after year. Now let's talk numbers. Take 20 mature honey locusts scattered through a pasture. Together, they'll drop about 2,000 pounds of pods every fall. At today's hay equivalent, roughly $250 a ton, that's $250 to $300 worth of feed falling out of the sky with no seed bill, no diesel, no labor. Now scale it. One acre planted with 100 pod bearers can yield close to 10,000 pounds of pods annually. That's over $1,000 in feed value per acre. And here's the kicker. Corn may gross the same, but after $400 in seed, $200 in fertilizer, and untold diesel passes, the net margin is far thinner. Trees don't have that overhead, and timing matters. Pods drop in late fall, exactly when stored hay is running low and feed bills spike. Instead of writing checks for grain, your animals are harvesting calories that literally rained down weeks before. Farmers already see the payoff. A Kentucky grazier finishing hogs on locust pods estimated his costs dropped 30% compared to corn. This is why regenerative farmers call it Skyfeed. $400 to $600 to establish a row. $1,000 plus per acre annual feed value once producing. That's a 2x payback window after it comes into bearing. It isn't just about saving money. It's about shifting the balance sheet in your favor, season after season. Here's the part most YouTube videos skip. The challenges. Because yes, trees like honey locust and mesquite can change your feed bills. But they're not without problems. First, genetics matter. Wild honey locust in North America is invasive in pastures for a reason. Thorny trunks, variable pod production, and spread by cattle. If you don't select improved sweet pod cultivars, you'll end up with a pasture nightmare instead of a feed system. Pod digestibility is another issue. Goats and pigs chew them fine, but cattle often need ground pods or ration mixes. Otherwise, you'll lose half the value as waste on the ground. This is where integrated systems shine. Pigs following cattle can literally turn those wasted pods into pork. 
Farmers have tracked pigs breaking down 15-20 pounds of pods a day, harvesting what cattle leave behind. And yes, shade does reduce grass yields under trees. That's a trade-off. But in silvopasture systems, spacing and rotational grazing can balance it. Some trials in the southeast found that even after accounting for shaded forage loss, honey locust rows increased total livestock, carrying capacity by up to 40%. The trick is in design, not just planting trees randomly. Another challenge is time. These trees don't pay back overnight. You may wait five to seven years before pod yields become significant. That's a long lag compared to planting corn. But once they hit maturity, you're harvesting for decades without replanting. It's a trade, short-term patience for long-term security. Researchers are starting to revisit these trees with fresh eyes. In one European trial, selected honey locust finding them competitive with barley and oats as an energy source. In the US, recent silvopasture case studies have shown that integrating fodder trees can cut purchased feed costs by 20 to 25%, while also improving carrying capacity. One Virginia farm trial documented soil organic matter increases of 0.2% per year under locust-based silvopasture. Small numbers, but significant when compared to stagnant or declining levels on neighboring open pastures. The bigger shift isn't yield alone, it's resilience. Once established, these systems continue producing through droughts, high input costs, or market shocks. A farmer planting fodder trees today isn't just planting feed, they're locking in a buffer against volatility that annual crops can't match. Here's something most people overlook. Feed trees don't just produce pods, they produce genetics. Once you have a handful of proven sweet pod locusts or heavy-bearing chestnuts, you can propagate cuttings, seedlings, or scion wood. That means a one can turn into hundreds of trees across your acreage, or even a side income selling planting stock. Farmers in the 1930s used this as a cash crop alongside feed, and it's still one of the fastest ways to multiply value from a single acre. One acre of feed trees can flip your economics. Thousands of pounds of pods dropping for free, livestock gaining faster, and soils rebuilding while you sleep. These systems fed whole nations before corn and soy took over, and they could again. So here's the challenge. If chestnuts still finish pigs in Europe and mesquite still fattens cattle in Texas, What's stopping us from planting the next generation of feed trees here? Would you put them on your land? Do you currently utilize any of these in your system? Let me know below and share this with a farmer who's sick of buying feed instead of growing it.